All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. Those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So now that the school year started, we're broadcasting 30, 40, even 50 live events uh, a month for classrooms. So today's a really special day. September 22nd is World Rhino Day. And to celebrate all day long, we've been connecting with scientists, with explorers, with conservationists, with filmmakers who have dedicated their, uh, their, their careers, their lives to protecting uh, our endangered rhino species. So there's five species around the world. All of them are threatened with extinction from things like poaching uh, and habitat loss. And we're meeting some amazing people who are documenting the issue, uh, creating amazing films, bringing it to the general public. We're also meeting the champions behind the scenes, the conservationists who are working hard uh, to save these rhino species. So today's event is pretty darn exciting. We are heading live to Kenya to visit Old Pejda Conservancy. We're gonna to get to meet the last two Northern white rhinos, Najin and Fatu. We're gonna learn a little bit about their story and we're gonna meet some of the, the rangers, the conservationists, the education staff who are working so hard to protect them. Old Pejda is also home to the largest black rhino sanctuary in East Africa. Uh, it's an absolutely amazing place and we are so thrilled and honored that we have a chance uh, to visit uh, on a regular basis. So I'm gonna bring Eva Kamini live into the call. Eva is education specialist at Old Pejda. Eva, how are you doing today? Hi, Joe. Um, it is a pleasure to be joining the classrooms live today from Old Pejda Conservancy. All right. Well, it's always great to see you. Excited to have you back with us today. Um, I'm going to switch camera views here. I'm going to bring both cameras in so you can see uh, a little close up there. But uh, yeah, it looks like another beautiful day in Old Pejeda. Signals coming through nice and clear, which is always great. Uh, so thank you so much to everybody who's making this possible today. Thank you very much. All right, so Eva, I think there's a little bit of a delay on your side. Are you able to still hear me okay? Looks like it's reloading, that's a good sign. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear Yes. Perfect, yeah, we gotcha. So Eva, I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit. Perfect, so um, yeah, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, um, we are happy to welcome you to Old Pejeta Conservancy. My name is Eva Kemani. I'm the education coordinator, as Joe has mentioned. Um, and I'm joined by some of my colleagues, um, some keepers of the Northern White Rhinos. Um, I'm joined by Jacob Anampiu and by Joseph Washira. These are longtime keepers of um, the last two Northern White Rhinos. Jacob, you want to come say hi to, to the people? Hi. <laughs> And hey, yes, Jacob. Jacob will be joining me a little bit later for a Q&A session towards the end. Um, but just to begin, we want to give you a brief context of what our Pejeta does, uh, besides um, taking care of very special rhinos. So we'll go to our first intro video. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, that was just a brief intro video just to give us a context of where we are at and what else we do. Um, and, and, you know, we I'm joined by our very special guest for the day, um, the last two Northern White Rhinos. <clears throat> and they are also joined by their very close friend who is a Southern White Rhino called Tao. Um, and especially on this World Rhino Day, they are our guests of honor. Um, and we want to learn a little bit more about them and how they got to be here and, and really just understand the backstory to, to the whole situation about trying to save the North and White rhinos from extinction. So as you see them here, um, Najin and Fatu, um, they literally are carrying a heavy weight on their shoulders. Um, they carry the weight of an entire subspecies on their shoulders. They carry the hope of an entire subspecies. 
Um, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, um, as, 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 as recently as the 1960s, there were close to 2,000 northern white rhinos that freely ranged um, the areas of Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Central Africa Republic. Um, but you, uh, over the years, because of increased civil conflicts um, and increased poaching, because of the civil conflicts and instability in those countries, the rhino population numbers dramatically declined to about 15 individuals in the 1970s and 80s. A huge decline, a sharp decline, in fact. Um, and and um, you know this, this is where this whole story began. But to take you a little bit back, in 1975, six rhinos were captured from their home rangeland of Sudan. Um, and these six rhinos were taken to the uh, Davakralov Zoo in the Czech Republic. Um, and of those six individuals, Sudan, who eventually was famously known as being the last male northern white rhino, was among them. And so these rhinos lived in a zoo for a very long time. And in fact, Najin and Fatu were born in captivity. Najin being born um, in 1989, um, she's now 31 years old, and Fatu being born in the year 2000, 20 years old. Um, so they have lived their entire lives in a zoo um, and they really never had that experience of living in the natural uh, rangeland of the northern white rhinos um, but over the years it was realized that um, as these animals continued to, to to live in the zoo the breeding um, kind of almost came to a halt in fact it's believed that fatu was uh, one of the last northern white rhinos to be born in captivity so the, the breeding stopped um, and scientists were concerned because this meant that um, this species was moving closer and closer to extinction. And so it was decided that something had to be done. Um, they thought that maybe bringing them back home to their native rangeland, to a familiar environment, would stimulate them to breed. Um, and so after much, um, uh, you know, much uh, negotiations and, and planning, they decided that all Pegeta Conservancy would be the best place for them to come. And therefore, uh, one time, one, a few days before Christmas, in the year 2009, uh, four northern white rhinos traveled by air and by road to Alpegeta Conservancy. And these rhinos were two males and two females. So we had Sudan, we had Sunni, those were the two males, and then we had Najin and her daughter, Fatu. In fact, Najin was the daughter to Sudan, and Fatu was the granddaughter to Sudan. So they came to Olpegeta um, on 20th December 2009. It was a great day. It was a beautiful day. We were all excited, but we knew the hard work that lay in front of us. We knew the amount of work that it would take to protect these animals um, and essentially try and save them from extinction. So immediately when they arrived, um, they were ushered in into their 700-acre enclosure, um, and they were also put under 24-hour armed um, security guard. Um, and also, when they arrived, they were given a friend. Um, they were given a friend who now is really their best friend and goes everywhere they go. And that's the southern white rhino at the far end called Tawo. And I'll tell you a little bit later um, about Tawo's role in all of this. So when the rhinos arrived, um, as I said, some of them had been born in captivity, and specifically the two that are here with us today. And therefore, they had never really had an experience of living out in the wild. So um, Tawo really became a teacher for them. Um, she taught them how to be wild rhinos, how to graze, um, how to eat grass, which you know would seem normal to a northern white rhino out in the wild. Um, but really, these animals had been so used to being fed with, with human food, bread and, and apples. Um, and, and so when they came here, Tawo really was a teacher. And, and to this day has remained to be a very good friend um, and close companion of the northern white rhinos. In fact, you'll never see them by themselves. Tawo is always alongside. Um, unfortunately, um, in 2014, uh, one of the, uh, the male northern white rhinos passed away due to Sunni, passed away due to um, natural, um, you know, natural conditions. So he, he had disease and, and um, he passed away. And that left Sudan as the last male northern white rhino the most eligible bachelor um, of the rhino world. Um, and so he was, he was the last male northern white rhino for a while. However, 
the plans by the scientists for the animals to come and start breeding and hopefully recover the rhino species um, numbers um, did not work as planned out. Um, and breeding season after breeding season, they realized that there was no pregnancy. Um, the rhinos were not having um, pregnancies and they were not giving birth to, to rhino calves. And this was a worrying trend. This was something of concern. So when the scientists did a bit of diagnosis, they realized that both the two females had a problem with their uterus. To add on to that, nudging, because of um, the long periods in the concrete zoos of the Czech Republic, had developed hind leg problems. And so she could not really carry the weight of a rhino pregnancy. So therein lie the problem. To, uh, to compound to this problem, um, unfortunately, in the year 2018, in March, um, Sudan, who was the last male North and White rhino, um, had been sick for a while. And he eventually, because we realized that his quality of life wasn't as good and he wasn't as happy because he was really sick. And at the age of 45, year old, uh, 45 years old, which is quite old for a rhino, um, Sudan, uh, the decision was made to, to put him down. And that left Najin and Fatu as the last two North and White rhinos um, on the planet. Um, which, you know, it's a very precarious situation that the rhinos find themselves in. Now, I want us to go to a brief video just to give you a, 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 a sort of a background of sort of the progress that we have had in terms of trying to recover this species. Um, because we identified, the scientists identified that the only way that they could save this species um, was through assisted reproduction, IVF, um, to be specific. This had never been done before in rhinos, um, and it was the first to be done. So a lot of research went into it, a lot of time, a lot of scientists from all over the world um, were able to put their minds together to, to see how they can assist these rhinos um, to reproduce artificially. And we'll go to a brief video um, um, just to show you a, a visual representation of the process that it has been to try and assist these rhinos to reproduce artificially. These are the last two northern white rhinos left in the world, Najin and Fatu. Without a male, there is no way for them to breed naturally. Experts from around the world have been working to invent a new method of reproduction to save these magnificent animals. Despite the risks involved, for the first time ever, northern white rhino eggs were successfully collected. They had to be immediately airlifted to a specialized lab for fertilization with frozen sperm from deceased northern white rhino males. This is a remarkable achievement for science but also a powerful reminder of how far we need to go to create hope for species on the brink of extinction. Thank you, Joe. Um, and, 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 you know, from that video, it's clear that, um, you know, this is a pioneer process. It's never been done before. So, um, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of research to be able to um, do something of this magnitude. Um, and just from the video, you know, you see how um, genetic material had been harvested from dead uh, northern white rhino males and had been stored in the frozen zoos in Berlin and San Diego. Um, and and that, that is what is being used. Um, together with the um, ovum that had been retrieved from the two females to try and create embryos. Um, and again, comes in the South and White Rhino, their best friend. Um, so Tao, which, um, who will be one of the surrogate moms, together with other South and White Rhinos, will really play a key role in helping this species to move away from that brink of extinction. Um, and looking at, looking at Najin and Fatu now, 
you can then you are able to then tell the kind of weight um, that that rests on their shoulders, um, an entire subspecies. Um, and it's unfortunate because all of this has been driven because of our demand as human beings for the rhino horn. The rhino horn, which is made essentially from the same thing that makes your fingernails and your hair, keratin. But because of the value that we have put on that horn, these animals have faced, um, you know, massacre and slaughter at a, 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 a huge rate. And it's unfortunate. Um, that that is the situation that we've put these animals in. On top of that, um, you find that this it has become a war. And in this war, there are many casualties, including the brave men and women who put their lives on the line every day to protect these animals and to protect the other animals um, on a conservancy like this and in other conservancies. Um, for Olpegeta, for example, we have a dedicated team of Kenya Police Reservists who every day put their lives on the line to protect this wildlife. Um, and yeah, in the, and they're caught in the crossfire. Um, many of them sometimes have been injured, some have lost their lives. And it's unfortunate that this is the situation that um, we find ourselves in. And we as human beings, we need to make a change. Um, because if we do not change our attitude, change our perceptions and our mentality towards wildlife, towards nature, towards the environment, what has happened to Fatu and Najin will continue to happen for tigers, for pangolins, for polar bears, for koala bears, for birds and bees, for our forests and mangroves, for our whales, turtles, and coral reefs. It's unfortunate, but we can make a change. It's for us to turn around and make a difference. You can make a difference in your neighborhood, in your school, in your country, for your planet. Because ultimately, it will take you and I and all of us to save all of us. So this is a call for action for each and every one of you. What are you doing for nature? Because ultimately, these are the natural resources that we so dearly depend on for our own livelihood. And if we do not make that turn around, we are on the race as a human species to our own self-destruction. So um, at that juncture, I'd like to invite my colleague, Jacob Anamhu, to help us answer some of the questions that you guys may have for us. Jacob, Haribo. <clears throat> so shoot, questions, we are ready to, for your questions, comments, opinions, bring them on. All right, excellent. Well, Eva, thank you so much. What a great job. Uh, thank you for that great, um, that great lesson, that great information about all the great work that you're doing at Old Pegida uh, to try and save uh, the species from the, the brink of extinction. And Jacob, thank you so much for joining us live today. We're looking forward to getting to know you a little bit better with some questions. You're most welcome. So we have a great group of classrooms and uh, people joining us from around the world right now, hundreds and hundreds tuning in. Um, those who are tuning in via Facebook and YouTube, um, use those chat sidebars. I can see everyone saying hi and, and such. Use those chat sidebars and start sending us in some questions because we're going to work uh, some of those questions into the live event. And I'm going to start going to some of our live classrooms now and we're going to start taking some of their uh, live questions. So let's get that started right now. We're going to head uh, this time to Mrs. Stouffer's class. I'm going to bring them live into the stream. There they are. How are we doing, boys and girls? Good. Take your All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you guys are joining us, I believe, from Florida, and looks like some third graders. So we'd love to see a question. Um, hi, my name is Jackson, and my question is: Are these rhinos like horses, to where if you get behind them, they kick back? I don't know. Are these like? Uh, are these rhinos like horses? So that's the question. The yeah, I'm kick uh, you. If you get behind one, would they kick us, Jacob? Yeah. <laughs> like horses. The rhinos? Yes. No, they cannot do that. <laughs> Quite different from the horses. <laughs> All right. But they can kick you with the horn. <laughs> All right. So, so they good to know. Their horns, yeah. Um, not their feet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
good to know. It's definitely the front where it's a little more dangerous. Um, and then what is the, we saw a couple little monkey species run by. What is it, black vervet monkeys? We call it vervet monkeys. Can you see them? They are trying to collect the pellets, the remains of the uh, rhinos. Coming in for a little snack. <laughs> Very cool. All right, so let's grab to another question. So this question's come in online a few times. Uh, people are wondering how old are Najin, are Najin and Fatu? Okay, uh, Najin is not one years, then Fatu is 20 years old. All right, very cool. Let's bring in another classroom live here. Let's see. Okay, we're gonna go to Mr. Bacchus's class. There are fifth graders who are joining us. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing fifth graders? Good. All right, excellent. Who's got a question for us? Okay. You can take off your mask. How big do they get? Did you hear that? How big do they get? Yeah. How big they do get the weight? Yeah. I think for the white rhinos, they are much heavier than rhinos. But for the white rhinos, the U.S two to three tons. Two to three tons, that's impressive. Um, awesome, thank you. That was our class who just joined us from Minnesota. Thanks for that awesome question. All right, let's join another class here. Let me bring them in. Here's Mr. Tom's class. Looks like someone's standing up there ready to go for us. How are we doing boys and girls? Good, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, why, why are their horns worth so much? Why are their horns worth so much? Why are they so valuable? The horns, well, they said, thank you. Uh, you know, the rhinos' horns are quite different from the ivory for the elephants. So people like pushing the rhinos for the horns because they are, some people can they say, they say that uh, they can cure cancer. Uh, and what have you, and many, many diseases, but quite yeah. different. And unfortunately, that's not true, is it? That's not true, is it? No. All right. Uh, so the, the rhino's horn. Go ahead, Jacob. The rhino's horn are very much uh, precious, especially for the people, for, uh, for China's people. And uh, they took it much important uh, because they, they sometimes even they keep on their on their on their houses as a as a very important yeah thing. And then also for the uh, for for curing uh, curing different diseases like asthma cancer and what have you. Okay. Um, yeah, and I've heard that uh, it can sell for up to $60,000 a kilogram. So you can see why they're in danger uh, from poaching. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a question coming in online here. Um, this question is, um, oh, there it is. So what um, what do rhinos do for the environment? What important things do they do to help the environment? Um, the earth and environment, the rhinos, especially their, their, their poops, they are so much, uh, they, are, they are so much fertile. If we happen to, to to collect some and try to put on uh, maybe on chaba on uh, on uh, on for our farms, they, they 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 are so much fertile to our crops, and also uh, you know rhinos are special. They are so much hygienic. Uh, they don't even poop everywhere that, like elephants. They have specific places where they go and poop, 
So on, on that area they cook, uh, the, the, when it rains, the grass grows uh, very much healthy on that area. All right, so they're very important for how they fertilize. Oh, sorry, Eva, go ahead. That's also to add on to what um, Jacob is saying. Um, you find that, um, just as he has said, um, the rhino poop is home for many other insects um, and things that depend on it for food, like the dung beetles. Um, you'll find sometimes they're inside the poop and they're making um, a little uh, dung ball to be able to, 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 to go and uh, put in their little holes and feed, feed themselves. Uh, but just like every other animal um, on the planet, the rhino has a very unique position in the environment. It, it occupies a niche um, in its food chain and in its ecosystem um, for, for where they are found. And so removing an animal from that ecosystem and that food chain and, and that whole system of um, different animals and plants, it creates um, a vacuum. And that also affects other things um, in the food chain as well. So they are important in their own right, in their own ecosystem um, as being herbivores. They, they play a critical role um, in their ecosystem and in their food chain. Okay, awesome. We're going to visit another classroom now, Mr. Steltman's group. They're joining us uh, in Ontario. Let me bring them into the call. How are we doing, boys and girls? Good. All right. Why is there three rhinos in the um, enclosure? So they want to know about the three. Why are there three? They didn't quite get the message. Okay. Um, where are the three rhinos um, instead of two? Okay. As you can see them, there are two. You can see these two are northern white rhinos. As Eva said, we have another, another one here, the southern white. And the southern white acts as if she happened like a their teacher. Immediately when they came here, we introduced her to them to teach them how to stay natural life. So she's also the one who taught them how to live, how to uh, sharpen their horns, the horns, because when they were in check, they used to stay uh, in a zoo in a very close area. So they could not, they had not enough space for them to roam around. So when they came here, the, the, we had two southern white rhinos, but we removed one. Then we are left with that one. So that one also, the southern white dog, as you can see her there, she, uh, she will also be the first surrogate mother. Yeah, so we have two northern white rhinos and one southern white rhinos. And they are friendly. They sleep together, they eat together, they do everything together. All right, great. It's good to have someone to look up to. Uh, let's join Mrs. Laws. She's joining us right now. Uh, how are you doing, Mrs. Laws? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. Great to have you joining us. You're representing your group who are joining us in North Carolina, so we'd love to steal a question. Yes. Um, so we're wondering, how do they usually get along with other animals? Um, do they have predators? And how do you keep people from poaching? Okay. The rhinos have got predators, especially for the calves. Uh, uh, a group of uh, lions can be attack, can attack calves and they can kill them. But the, the calves are very much protected by the mothers. And uh, so they cannot be able uh, to attack the calves immediately. So they have to, uh, the, the mother have to defend the calves very much and uh, also um yeah about poaching what do we do about poaching uh, poaching here in our conservatory we have tight security here so we don't have uh yeah 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 they, are, they protect our rhinos everywhere so we have, we have in, uh, enough weapons to secure our rhinos yeah, just, just to also add on to that, um, I think I had mentioned before, we have a team of um, Kenya Police Reserve who are based on the Conservancy, um, and they work round the clock, 
to protect not just the rhinos but every other um, animal on the conservancy we also have a team of um, um, dog we have a dog unit um, these are tracker sniffer dogs and attack dogs and they help the kenya po police reserve team um, in essentially eliminating and dealing with a poaching um, threat that may come up Uh, let's grab a question from online here. This one's from Miss Michael's group. They're in Illinois, and Emma wants to know when rhinos are in the wild, what would they be eating? Oh, did you catch that question, uh, Eva? Uh, Emma's wondering, she's in Illinois, wants to know what the rhinos eat in nature. What do they eat when they're in the wild? Um, so when, when the rhinos are in the wild, um, the, the white rhinos specifically are grazers. So they eat grass, yeah? Um, they graze on grass, just like cows would graze on grass. Um, that is their main diet. However, for the northern white rhinos, when they came initially because they had been so used to being fed in the zoo and they did not have any experience of grazing on their own, um, they are, they are their diet is supplemented. So they do graze on grass primarily, but their diet is supplemented with um, carrots and pellets, which is what the little monkeys are trying to steal, the carrots and the pellets. But uh, primarily they are built um, to eat grass. All right, awesome. We're gonna visit Mr. Susco's class. Fourth graders joining us in Pennsylvania. Let me bring them into the live stream. Pennsylvania. Hello. All right. How many rhinos were there 50 years ago? So we'd like to know how many rhinos were there 50 years ago or 100 years ago? How quickly has their population decreased? Um, sorry, just say that again. I, di I didn't catch that. Sure, we'd like to know. I can, I can relay that for you, Eva. Yes, please. Yeah, they're wondering about how quickly the population decreased. 50 years ago, how many would there have been and how quickly did it decrease? Okay, so from, from so in about the 1960s, there were about 2,000 um, northern white rhinos. By about 1980s or about 15 individuals, um, the number did rise a little bit to about 32 um, going towards the 2000. But uh, currently, there's no, uh, there's no known northern white rhino in the wild. Um, and it is considered that these are the last two known northern white rhinos on the planet. From about 2000 in the 1960s um, to about 15 in the 1980s. And then um, completely extinct in the wild. All right, excellent. So boys and girls, thank you for those great questions to start. I think we've visited each of our classrooms at least once. Keep those questions coming in uh, online as well. and We'll work some more of those in. But for now, why don't you give me a wave from your classroom if we need to visit your class again, if you guys have a follow-up question. We'll pick a couple of classrooms that we can follow up with. So let's start with Mrs. Kump's group. I'll bring you back in. What's your question, go ahead. My question is when they uh, when they trim the horn, um, in order to raise more money for the organization, do they do anything with the horn? And if not, then why don't they sell the horn to raise more money for the organization? And they can say that no animals were harmed in the um when uh, um yes. in getting the horn. Okay, Eva, did you catch that? I, I caught some part of it. I didn't hear the last portion of it. I don't yeah. know if you can relate to me. She was wondering um, why maybe that, you know, cause the horn can be removed safely. Um, why the horn isn't removed and maybe sold to help protect them, to raise money. Is that a possibility? Um. I don't know what Jacob thinks, but um, for myself, I, I, you know, the whole issue and the whole problem that we have is the demand for the horn. And yes, it can be cut safely, 
Um, in fact, it's just like your fingernails. When you trim your fingernails, they grow back out. Um, it's the same thing. So even when they're trimmed, they do grow back. However, um, and, and different people have different schools of thought. Uh, but for us, and especially our country, Kenya, and the kind of policies that we have, we believe that cutting the horn to sell it um, just further fuels the demand. You know, it's like adding uh, firewood to an already existing fire. And, um, you know, we, we are trying to, to, to put out the fire, not to, you know, kind of fuel it. So uh, there's a school of thought that by selling the horn, by cutting the horn and selling it, you're encouraging more people to want the horn. Um, the demand will increase. And then if you cannot meet that demand, it means people will then still kill rhinos. So the idea is to kill the fire and stop the demand um, completely. And that's why we, we try not to. We say the rhino is worth more alive and the rhino horn belongs to the rhino, right? It is like your fingernails. It's a part of their body. Um, and it is unfair that they have to live with a part um, of their body missing because we, we want it. It's not a need. Uh, it's not something that we need to survive. It's not something that um, is essential for us. And therefore, I think it's easier for us to change our habits and say we don't really need this this rhino horn to 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 make a sculpture to put on your desk. Um, you know, the rhinos need their horn. We don't need their horn, so that's why we don't cut it. All right, an excellent excellent point. We don't want to create demand. Um, you know, it's it, much better if it wasn't being used at all. Good stuff. Uh, okay, let's go back. I think I saw some waving in Mr. Bacchus's class. Let me bring them back into the stream. There they are. Go ahead, Becca. How long does a rhino's pregnancy last? All right, how long is a rhino's pregnancy? Great question. Perfect. Jacob, you want to answer that? How long is a rhino pregnancy? Okay, for the white rhinos, the gestation period is 16 to 17 months, but for the black is 15 to 16 months. All right. Yeah. Perfect. So almost double um, the human pregnancy, um, almost almost two times of that 16 months. Yeah. And then twins are pretty rare. Is that right? There's usually just one. I don't know if Jacob has seen a twin bath of rhino. No. Cow. See, I have only one. If you back to one cup. One at a time. One at a time, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's head back to Pennsylvania. I think that they had another question. We do. Make sure you're nice and loud. Great. Nice and loud. What's the difference between white rhinos and black rhinos? Okay, so the question was, what's the difference between white rhinos and black rhinos? And black rhinos, good. Okay, the difference between white rhinos and black rhino is that um, the white rhinos, as you can see them here, the southern and northern, the whales, as I told you, three tons and above. But for the black rhino, it's one point five tons. So black black ones weigh less. Another one is what they hit, if they graze on, or what they feed on. White rhinos are grazers, they feed on grass, but black rhinos are browsers. They browse the leaves. Another one is about their mouth. The black rhinos have got prolonged lip or a pointed lip. For the white rhinos, they have wide mouth, as you can see them. Maybe you can see them there. Another one is about their behaviors. White, uh, white trainers are less aggressive. Uh, they are same. They are same aggressive. They are same social as uh, black trainers. They are always aggressive. They have high tempers. Yeah, they can attack you any time. So whoever can see maybe black trainers in front of you, just come back. Don't go. Don't proceed continuing going back and going ahead must must uh, try to hide yourself another one is about um, how they live for the white rhinos they they live in open areas in open grassland but for the black rhinos they live in dense 
bushes. They like to stay in bushes. And that's why they have high tempers. You can all see them easily in the open areas. But for the white rhinos, they are less. Another one is um, black rhinos are solitary. They like staying in, they like staying alone. Not unless when they are mating or with a mother and the, and the calf. But for the white rhinos, we can see them in a group of five and even five, ten, ten of them. So that's the difference. All right, Jacob, that was awesome. What a great answer. There's a lot of great differences from behavior to how they look to what they eat. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was great. Um, I know Mrs. Law has another question. So let me bring her back into the stream. There we go. So my kids are wondering, how do you know that these are the last two? Um, and what is it like to visit the Conservancy in person? All right, so I can relay, relay that one a little bit, Eva, just in case uh, you missed it. It looks like the signal might be pausing on us a little bit, so let's give it a second to clear up. Oh, there we go. Eva, can you still hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, Joe. Perfect. So uh, that class in North Carolina, they were wondering, how do we know for sure it's the last two of the subspecies? And then what's it like to visit Old Pegeta? Um, how can we know for sure? I mean, it's um, this is something that has so far um, in terms of um, research and in terms of um, the information that is out there globally, um, there has not been a sighting of northern white rhinos in the wild since a very long time ago. So um, based on environmental environmentalists and researchers and all the information that has been gathered, of, gathered over so many years, the evidence shows um, that they, there has been no sighting, there has been no evidence of a northern white rhino out in the wild. And therefore that has left us to know and believe that um, these are the last two of their kind. Um, what it's like to visit Alpegeta, ah, it's amazing. It's a beautiful place. You're out in the wild. There is lots of animals. We have all the big five. The only place in Kenya where you see chimpanzees, very intelligent animals, the only place where you see Najin and Fatu. Um, and we have great, great experiences, immersive experiences for you to experience uh, when you visit us. Um, you could go lie on track. You could come visit Najin and Fatu. You could go see the chimpanzees. Um, there's lots for you to do. It's an amazing place for both adults and kids. We have so many experiences um, for you to come and enjoy. So please do come when you get a chance and when it's possible, um, please do come and visit us. You can only um, experience it to believe it. All right, very cool. I'm sold. Uh, Mrs. Stouffer's class, you have another question. Yes, um, they, they were unclear. Are one of the white rhinos expecting baby? Um, not yet, not yet. Um, after they harvested the, they collected the eggs from the females um, and they combined it to, uh, together with the sperm that had been collected in a lab. Um, they formed embryos. So we have three embryos in a lab somewhere in Italy that are awaiting to be uh, put into a surrogate southern white rhino. So right now, the, what the scientists are doing, they're trying to time um, when is the best time to put the embryos inside the southern white rhinos uh, when they are ready um, to, so that the embryos will be able to implant and we'll have a baby. But as of now, not yet. Um, none of them have yet. But we are hoping very, very soon that we will have some um, the embryos put in the southern white rhinos and hopefully we'll have some good news for you um, very soon. All right. Very cool. We've got a question from online from Norwich and they're wondering how much of the day uh, or night do the rhinos sleep? Do they have to sleep a lot? How long do the rhinos sleep, Jacob? Mm, sometimes when they have enough space or when they are in outside, they can graze the whole, with the white rhinos, they can graze the whole night. But 
during the day they sleep half of the day so when it becomes too hot they have to go and rest on shade all right perfect i want to bring in our last class mr steltman's group and see if they have one more question for us before we um wrap up for today are you there mr steltman my question is in the winter what do the rhinos do like um if i caught that correctly if there's winter what do the rhinos do yeah do you guys have like a colder season or a rainier season what do they do um so, so winter a colder season in um, africa in east africa specifically does not um, involve snow so it gets really cold around june july um that's the really cold months um, of the year and when it's raining they get very jumpy and excited um they skip a lot like um you know they skip like bunnies they get excited when they are wet um, and when it's raining uh, but out in the wild rhinos they you know they they don't have a home so they live out in the wild even when it's raining they're out there when it's sunny they're out there um so yeah they're used to being out in the wild that's why they're wild they're wild animals so it doesn't really affect them that much um only that you will sense that they they get very excited when it's raining all right very cool so one more question uh from online it's actually more of a point someone's making eva can you tell us a little bit about the virtual uh sofa safaris cool um so the the sofa safari is an opportunity to involve you guys um as you're at home and possibly not able to visit us um during this time because of the corona uh, pandemic it's an opportunity for you guys to still experience or Pedrata to still experience nature and wildlife virtually. Um, so, you know, everything now is moving virtual. So we, you know, we thought, you know, we still, we still want to engage with you guys even as you're at home and not able to visit us physically. Um, and we still want you to experience nature and wildlife. So that was the idea behind it. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to engage like we are today and in other forums and in different settings all throughout the conservancy doing different things. Um, so that was the idea behind it. Uh, but currently we are open and whoever is able to visit us physically, we are, uh, you know, we, we are excited to receive you. We are receiving visitors even um, as we speak. But for those who are not able to visit us, these virtual experiences allow you to still connect with nature and connect with wildlife. Um, and still keep us on your mind for when you're able to come. Amazing. And the last point I want to bring up, Eva, if if people wanted to donate, you know, especially with today being World Rhino Day, is the website the best place to visit uh, to make a donation so you can continue doing the amazing conservation work you're doing? Absolutely. The the website will lead you um, on to how to uh, will lead you to be able to donate to our cause. Um, you know, we 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 are here and we are able to do what we do because of the support that you guys give us. We would not be able to do any of it without your generous support. Um, and therefore the website, yes, is open and um, it's, it's the best place, it's easy interactive for you to be able to, to make a donation. So we will run, we will run the website. We will um, show the website um, on our social media pages so that you're able to also connect with us easily. Um, so we will we'll run that link um, for you on the social media pages as well. All right, excellent. Well, I wanna start off by a huge, huge thank you to all our classrooms who joined us uh, live on camera. Thank you for your great questions. A huge thank you to those who tuned in via YouTube and Facebook. We had a huge group from all over the world uh, joining us live today. Um, huge thank you obviously to uh, Najin and Fatu. It looks like maybe they're getting a little bit tired after all that eating. Looks like they're having a little bit of a rest. And, uh, you know, Eva, I want to thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Jacob, thank you for taking so many great questions. Jojo, I know your work in the camera behind the scenes. Thank you so much. And Victor and the rest of the team, thank you for making this possible today. It was an absolutely incredible way uh, to spend World Rhino Day. Thank you so much, Jo. It was our pleasure as well um, to host you on The Conservancy. Um, from the entire team, the North and White Rhinos, everybody behind the cameras, 
um, and all my other colleagues who made this possible. We just want to say thank you. It was a pleasure to come into your classrooms today. Um, and we look forward to have many more sessions like this. Go tell your friends, go tell your parents, go tell everybody about the rhinos and how we are trying to protect them. And you go and make a difference in your neighborhood and in your school. Thank you so much. And um, it was our pleasure as well. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. One last look. We'll put the rhinos up again. Thank you so much, Old Pejida uh, in Kenya. Thank you for the work you do. And we are going to sign off for today.